start. Shine within our hearts, loving master, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds we understand the message of your gospel. Instill in us also the reverence for your blessed commandments, so that putting down all sinful desires, we pursue a spiritual life, thinking and doing all those things that are well-pleasing to you. We are blessed together, beginning with Father, and your all holy, good, and life-creating spirit, now and ever, into the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. All right. So we are now in week number two of Exodus. Uh, before we begin, let's uh, go ahead and... Uh, have a little review of what we talked about last week. Um, so if anyone likes to say in their own words, kind of what we encountered in the first five chapters of Exodus. At the birth of Moses, we had uh, the child being taken by uh, Pharaoh's daughter. Mm -hmm. And Moses uh, was uh, living in Egypt. Uh, as Pharaoh's son, so to speak, stepson, mm -hmm. whatever, and uh, he encountered uh, an Israeli, uh, an Egyptian, and he killed one of them, mm -hmm. and met with him the next day. He saw two Hebrew children or two Hebrew kids fighting each other, and they said, "Who are you?" He killed the Egyptian. So Moses got uh, fearful, and he ran away. And he went to Midian. Is it Midian? He went to Midian, but so first of all, why was why was Moses given to Pharaoh's daughter? What happened? Why was that necessary? Why was it necessary? Right. Why was it necessary for Moses to be, uh, you know, for that iconic scene of being in the uh, in the river, Nile River? He was to rescue him from his execution. Right. Why was he being executed? Why? What was? Why did Pharaoh want him executed? He put all the male children executed. Right. Why? Why did the Israelites are getting stronger, yeah. and more in number, and he was afraid. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to get rid of all the Israelites because God was continuing to bless them despite what was, what was their station? What, what was happening to the Israelites? They were slaves. They were slaves. And how is it different to what, what were they experiencing 400 years prior? Well, they, were, they were in the land with Joseph. They were, they were blessed. They, they were, were very blessed. Very well. They were very, very wealthy. They were doing very, very well. And Pharaoh considered Joseph like his own son. Now, flash forward 400 years, the Israelites continue to increase, they continue to be uh, prosperous, and so they've now been made into not just slaves, but the worst kind of slave. And now, in order to stop them from basically getting more people, all the males have been tasked with being executed. And then Moses' mother put him in the reed so that Pharaoh's daughter would find him. She raises him as her own. And what was kind of interesting about Moses' mother after that? The Orthodox Study Bible said that this is perhaps the only woman who acted as nursemaid to her own son. Yeah. Yes. So Moses killed a, uh, an Egyptian that was beating on one of the Israelites. And he would have thought that, okay, my people will like me because I protected them. But what ended up happening? As you said, Peter, they rejected him. They said, what, are you going to kill us now too? And so now he's facing capital punishment for what he did because Pharaoh saw him as a foreigner but still brought him in and raised him as a son. And then he essentially betrayed him. He said, okay, you, you killed one of ours. Well, then you're, you're marked for execution. So he runs away because he has no uh, solace in his own people and he has no solace from his adopted people. So Moses has nobody. And so he goes and yokes himself to a shepherd in Midian. And he marries a woman named Zipporah. And she has two children. And while he is in Midian, he has an encounter. Now, what happened in that encounter? Oh, the burning bush? The burning bush on Mount Sinai. Now, why is that significant? What, what, what does the burning bush mean? Why do, why do we care about that, that interaction? Christ appears in the burning bush. It is a theophany, the voice of God, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How is the Holy Spirit present? The fire. And why is this mode of the burning bush, the bush that is not being consumed by the fire, important? What does it portend to our story of salvation? 
Theotokos. The Theotokos, exactly right. She is the bush. She that had God inside her was not consumed. Just the fire uh, did not consume the bush. So then God says to Moses, you are going to go and be my mouthpiece. And what does Moses say? Does he accept this uh, task no, happily? I can't speak. I, no. He says, I'm not worthy. I'm not a good speaker. There's other people you could get to do this job. And what does God say? He said, you can do it. And he, he again said no. And then finally he says, okay, Aaron, your brother, will be the spokesman for you. So they both went together. So he says that if you will not believe what I say, that I will give you the power to speak over your enemies, then I will give you help. And then he said that the Israelites won't believe me. How are they going to believe me? So what did, uh, what did God do? He gave them a staff. He had him hit it on the ground and it became a serpent. It became a serpent. And so what is that symbolic of? That it became a serpent, a staff that is a serpent. Symbol of the enemy becoming a staff. What does that symbolize? Satan, the devil. Symbolizes Satan, the devil, kind of, but not really. What is going to happen in the desert? It's the serpent that's raised up, and Christ himself says it. Just as the serpent was raised in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So that staff represents what? The cross. It represents the cross. It is going to take the symbol of death and make it into life. And to make that image even more acute, what happens to Moses' hand? Leprosy. It became leprous. It became full of death, full of sin. And then immediately it was cured, which meant that our sin is going to be cleansed. So... For Moses, this might have looked like, okay, this almost looks like a magic trick, but the reality is, is that these two miracles that are going to allow him to have the Israelites believe him are symbolic of our conquering over death and sin. So when he gets to the Israelites, do they believe him? Not at first. No. And then they believe him, but then what is, how does Pharaoh answer them when Moses says, you're going to let my people go? He's like, you're lazy. you lazy people. And what does he say? What does he do to them? What is, how does he make their, their, their lives more miserable? He makes them work harder and then goes and gives them bricks. Or he, gives them straw. he doesn't give them, he doesn't give them straw. So for, that, for them to make their bricks, you have the straw to basically hold the materials together. It says, now you're going to have to go get the straw yourself. I'm not going to provide it for you. And yet your quota, the amount of bricks you have to make per day, which was already really, really hard, is not going to be lessened. And so how did the Israelites respond to that? Started turning against Moses. Started turning against Moses. We're going to notice this as a theme going forward. <laughs> uh, so they turn against Moses. So despite the fact that they were given signs to show who he was, it didn't matter. They still turn against him. What have you done? You've made our life worse. You didn't make it better. You made it worse. He's going to say, you made our life worse. Right. They blame him. They don't even blame him. They don't work, no, they, they, to them, they look at Pharaoh as their enemy. Like, you, you should have known that this is how Pharaoh was going to react, and yet you made this work. And yet, the Lord look on you and judge because you've made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and the sight of his servants to those who are going to us later. And yet, God promises deliverance. So right before uh, chapter 6, on verse 22 of chapter 5, so Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you sent me? From the time I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has afflicted the people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. And so Moses is, he too is turning on God a little bit saying, okay, why did you send me here? Because it's accomplished nothing. Now it, it, it's not gotten better. It's gotten worse. And now we're going to begin chapter six. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them from his land. God also spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as their God, but I did not reveal to them my name, Lord. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of the Canaanites, the land of the sojourn in which they were strangers. Now, this is important because when Moses was leaving the burning bush, he asked God, 
who will I say sent me? And what did God respond? I am. I am. Why is that important? Christ also uses that group in the same Greek. John mm -hmm. and Luke. Luke. Correct. When, he said, when they said, on what authority? Yeah. Are you greater than Moses? Are you greater than Abraham? Yeah. And Jesus Christ said, before Moses, before Abraham, before all the fathers, I am. If we look at the halo of Jesus Christ, in the halo of the cross, it is Omicron Omega Ni, or On, which states, I am. Now, why is that significant? Why would that matter? It's also translated, I am the one who is, or I am. The it is the one. existing one, I am who is. But what it is, is basically it's an open sense. Okay. In other words, I am blank, which shows us that God is what you need him to be. I am your father. I am your brother. I am your healer. I am your friend. I am which shows that his title, his name, is more than just a name that we can have power over. It is show I am what you need. And this was a powerful delineation because as he's saying right now to Moses, I didn't give my name to Abraham. I didn't give my name to Joseph. I gave you my name. I am the existing one. He who is. I have a question about verse 3. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, this is a Protestant Bible, so it's the Masoretic text. And I think it basically says, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, which I think is translated in Hebrew as a Elohim, mm -hmm. by my name. And then I think he changes his name to Jehovah. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously this is Greek. So, I mean, one of those words is theos. Do you know what the other one is? Um, I don't. Uh, Elohim, the El basically means God. So anytime yeah, you so see... Elohim, God, most of them. Right. Yeah. So basically, you, you, anytime you're seeing that, it's kind of... Okay. The translation to that. Um, so there's maybe it's Theos. Right. It's Kyrios. Kyrios would be Lord. Lord. So Theos would be God. Okay. Right. That makes sense. So the Orthodox Study Bible states, The son of the father appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as their God. He told Jacob, for example, that he is the Lord, but he did not show him the power he had over all the earth. Now he was about to reveal his almighty power in relation to the Egyptians, for he is the wisdom and the power of the Father. After he became incarnate and in many places of the New Testament, he is now called the Lord Jesus Christ. So now he is about to reveal why he is the Lord. He has blessed his, his servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's without question. And that was one of the reasons why anywhere that they went, the people that they were around basically said, okay, stay here because your God keeps blessing you and things keep going well. And hither to this moment, everyone was looking at the Hebrew God as just one of many gods. Mm -hmm. The idea that, well, that, that's their God, and we have our God. We haven't achieved the point yet where we're going to see God as the only God. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to kind of what you were talking about, the titles of God. Because what was God's original title? What was his original title? It wasn't Elohim. It was El Shaddai. It was El Shaddai. God of the mountain. Oh. Where, where, where is that? It's in Genesis. Genesis. So that was kind of where God was first revealing himself okay. to, to Abraham. Yeah. So it's been basically a sequence of revelations, a sequence of bringing us to the point where Jesus Christ will reveal his name, himself by his name. Mm -hmm. And even then, it's kind of problematic to just call that a name because there's a couple of things. First of all, when we give somebody a name, what does that connotate? power over that person, right? This is why that scene in Roots was so important with Kunta Kinte, because by having a name, you have authority over that person. By not having a name, God is exercising his extreme power. But even when he has his name, when he says, I am the Christ, what is that? Christ is a title. And even the name Yeshua, Isus, that's his name, but what does it mean? Savior. Savior. Mm -hmm. So Tirios. And the other name he has, Emmanuel. What does that mean? God is with us. So all of his names are actually characteristic qualities, mm -hmm. talking about what he is even more than who he is. And so this shows us power, that it is not a name in which we can have authority over it. Mm -hmm.
I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the Egyptian tyranny. I will rescue you from their bondage and redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgments. I will take you as my people and be your God. Then you shall know I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the Egyptian tyranny. I will also bring you into the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'll give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they paid no heed to Moses because of their faint-heartedness and cruel bondage. The Orthodox Study Bible states, The son of the father is speaking, and the Jews were to know he was the Lord their God, together with his father and the Holy Spirit. When he became incarnate, he revealed the father and the Holy Spirit to the Jews in full measure. The children of Israel had a heart problem. They were willing to believe, but not to suffer for the Lord's sake. Therefore, they were faint-hearted and disobedient because of their cruel bondage. Now, this really should bring us to mind Jesus' parable of the sower. Essentially, Moses has been sent to give the word of God to the people. But what is happening to the people? It's not finding good soil. It's not able to grip into it. So basically, cares of the world happen, and it rips it out. For a moment, they're happy. For a moment, they're joyous. But the second adversity comes, the word is plucked out, ripped from them. And so that's why they are faint-hearted. That is why they do not have the ability to accept what Moses is telling them. Despite the fact that if we really pay attention to what God has said through Moses right here, I am your Lord, I will be your God, and you will be my people, shows a covenant. It shows connection. It shows that God has never separated himself, but allowed them to go through what they're going through. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go in. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to send forth the children of Israel from his land. Moses then spoke before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have paid no heed to me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am not eloquent. Thus the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and gave them a commandment for the children of Israel, and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to send forth the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So again, God is telling Moses, I will give you the mouth you need. Sure, you have Aaron, but I am all you need. I am sufficient. But we see Moses again and again and again has doubts. Moses again and again is not ready to believe fully. And this is one of the reasons why Moses will not see the promised land. Because of this doubt that keeps coming back again and again and again. But what's interesting about this to us? Because Moses, and I don't know we saw this in Abraham, But Moses is supposed to be the creme de la creme for our Jewish history. Even though history would kind of tell us otherwise, Moses is the one that has has written the Pentateuch. He's the main character. He's the author. And most of the times authors would shy themselves as kind of beacons of hope, beacons of glory. But what we're seeing is a fallen, sinful vessel. We're seeing Moses' weakness. And why is that important? Why is it important that we see Moses' weaknesses, his insecurities, and his humanity? What is significant about it? relates to us. We're the same way. Exactly. It shows Moses' humanity so that God's glory might be made more manifest. So that our weakness, because we might say, you know what? I'm not like Moses. I'm not like Abraham. I'm not like Jesus. You don't have to be. God can take our fallen nature, our broken vessels, and use it the way it needs to be used. Now these are the heads of the father's houses. The sons of Reuben, the first of Israel, were Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Garmin. This is the family of Reuben. Now the sons of Simeon were Jamuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jakin, Zohar, and Shaul, the sons of the Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. Now these are the names of the sons of Levi according to their genealogy, Gershon, Kahath, and Merari. And Levi lived 137 years. The sons of Gershon were Libni and Shimi, the house of their family. The sons of Kohath were Amram, Izar, Hebron, and Uziel. And Kohath lived 133 years. The sons of Merari were Milhal, Mushi. These are the families of Levi according to their kindreds. Now Amram took as his wife Jochebed, the daughter of his father's brother. And she bore him Aaron and Moses and Miriam, their sister. And Amram lived 137 years. The sons of Izar and Korat, Nebek and Zivri, the sons of Uziel and Mishal, el and Zithri. Now Aaron took as his wife Elishaba, daughter of Aminadab, the sister of Nashon. 
And she bore him Nabab, Abidhu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. The sons of Korah were Azmir, Chana, and Abisal. This is the genealogy of Korah. Eleazar, Aaron's son, took his wife, one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phineas. These are the heads of the families of the Levites according to their genealogy. Now these are the same Aaron and Moses to whom God said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt with their army. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are the same Moses and Aaron. Now you've noticed they said it like three times. Mm -hmm. And similarly, they kept saying, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. Why are they repeating so much? Why is that important? What's, what's with the repetition? And what's with the genealogy? Why is that significant here? In the genealogy, you can follow it to Christ, right? Well, for us, yes, but more for the Jewish people. This okay. is the story of their history. This is the story of where they came from. This is also an, an element of why we know that there are multiple authors, because this feels like it was spliced in to try to bring context to what's going on. But to say again, this is the same Moses and Aaron, same Moses and Aaron, same Moses and Aaron. Yeah. Because did either of you take Shakespeare in high school? There's a lot of repetition. Why was the repetition? To get it to sink in. To get it to sink in. Because this was oral. Yes. So this story was being told to the Jewish people orally. So again and again and again, we hear this so that it's getting beaten into our skulls to understand the significance of what's going on. All of these characters are important. The genealogy is important because to them, this is, this is their connection to say, okay, our connection from Abraham all the way down to show who we are. That's part of the Jewish genealogy. That's important to them. But for us and for the, the listener, what's really important to understand is that, okay, you, you heard a bunch of names, but ultimately the, the main names you need to hear are Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. As a side note, um, before we continue, what did we talk about last week about the name Miriam? Her name, Mary. Her name is Mary. Her name is Mary, right. And this is significant because in the, uh, the Masoretic, Miriam... What does it translate to? Bitter. So, so bitter is the idea that somehow the name means something that is not good. So some people refer to, the, to Mary as kind of the bitterness of humanity. Until you look at the Egyptian translation of the name Miriam, and what does Miriam mean in Egyptian? highly favored one, which shows us that Miriam, the, the first Mary that we really encounter in scripture was not named after Hebrew language, but after the Egyptian language, which makes sense because that's where they were for the last 400 years. But there any most have similar meanings in Egyptians? That I'm not sure. Okay. I have to, I'd have to look into that. Mary is the only one that I know definitively, okay. uh, which is significant because when Gabriel has his first interaction with Mary, what does he say to her? Hail highly favored one, which is a play on her name. In the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to him, I am the Lord. Again, saying it again. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. Moses said before the Lord, behold, I am weak in speech, and how will Pharaoh heed me? So we keep hearing it again and again and again. This is really to kind of beat into us. Moses feels he is ill-equipped for this task, and God is trying to tell him, I am the Lord. This will happen. Tell him what I told you. You can do this because I'm the one who's telling you. Exactly. And yet Moses is still full of doubt, still full of worry, still, you know, Cogs is like, okay, well, the people aren't listening to me. The people aren't listening to me. How's, how's the Pharaoh going to listen to me? It's like, and we can kind of put ourselves in Moses' shoes to say, oh, my God. You've been tasked with this great big job, and yet you feel ill-equipped to do it. Six hundred thousand people. Yeah, you're ill-equipped now, and you're like you're the one. Now, what does this sound like? You've been given a task by God that you feel completely ill-equipped to do. That you don't know how to do it, and yet God is essentially telling you, "Don't worry, I will handle it for you." It relates to me in my life right now because my mother's coming back home again. It's like a real concern. It's like I can't handle her. I can't do it. The Lord gave me these promises. They're going to happen afterwards. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I told you I'm going to get you through this. It's like, mm -hmm. so it's like, okay, I got to trust you. But it's 
that easy. This goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Because Adam and Eve, they were given a task. What was their task? To take care of, uh, to take yeah. care of, to take care of the garden. But that verb, take care, it has a different translation. What's another word for care for the garden? Guard the garden. Mm. Protect the garden. Except there's a problem. Protect it from what? They didn't know. Of course not. They had no idea. What am I protecting it from? Because they had not eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They have no concept of what evil is. So they were given a task. And they have no idea how to do it. They have no idea what that even means to care for the garden. And what was the ultimate goal of that? What were they supposed to do? Were they supposed to listen to the serpent and then eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil so that they could do their job? What was, that, what was God intending for them to do? They were, they were to uh, get the land and to, to uh, recreate, to have children and repopulate the earth. Well, not yet. At that moment, when they were given that task, tend the garden, take care of the garden, guard the garden, they were supposed to turn to God and say, help me. Show me how to do it. But instead of doing it, they try to take it on themselves. You have no idea how long it was after they were born. They ate it. They actually fell into sin. You don't well, that, that's a say time. I mean... We, we don't know. It's, it's within creation, but it's, it's not explicitly stated. We know what was explicitly stated. The, the, the statement of the garden and then most immediately after uh, the fall of Eve. But what we're seeing here in Moses is Moses is trying, like Adam and Eve, and like every other fall of humanity, to do it on our own, to look at our own capabilities and say, okay, well, this I can do or this I can't do, without recognizing God has continuously been trying to get us to turn to him and say, help me, and he will make it happen. So this is a continuing element that we have seen again and again and again in the story of our salvation. And we're going to continue to see it, where God continues to look for us. Remember the words of Jesus Christ, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times would I have gathered you in like a mother hen with her chicks, and yet you would not. So we're seeing this, this theme of God continuously reaching out. I will empower you to do what you think is impossible. With man, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And yes, Moses was chosen out of 600,000 people. You are the one. Not because of your greatness. Not because you have qualities that no one else has. but Because you will show to have faith. Now the Lord said to Moses, beginning chapter 7, See, I have made you a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. You shall speak all I command you, and Aaron your brother shall speak to Pharaoh to send the children of Israel from his land. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. So the Orthodox Study Bible says, The Lord made, god, the Lord made Moses a god to Pharaoh, but it is one thing to be made a god, lowercase g, Another to be God, capital G. The scripture uses the name God in three ways. One, gods in name only, as are Moses and the saints. Two, false gods, as are the demons and idols. And three, the true God, as is the Father. Moses was God in name only, but not in nature. For the Son is true God of true God, because he is God both in name and in nature. For before all time and ages he is begotten from God to be God, he is begotten not made. So again, we're seeing this progression of revelation. God is speaking, saying, you are going to be like God to Pharaoh, because that's what Pharaoh understands. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh understands the concept of men being gods. Yeah. So Moses, that was going to have these powers, that's something that Pharaoh would understand. It's within his realm of understanding. And yet, this is not reality. And yet, it is reality in the sense that it is our goal in life. Theosis. Deification. St. Athanasios states in his work on the Incarnation, God became man so that man could become like God. Another rendition of that says God became man so that man could become God. But again, it is capital G versus lowercase g, that man is becoming a lowercase g, like unto God, having similar qualities unto God, but not God in his essence. 
So Moses is going to have these godly attributes, these godly characters. And when it says that Aaron will be a prophet, it really helps us understand what the term prophet means, mouthpiece of God. And so Aaron is going to be Moses' mouthpiece. So in, in the Psalms, when it says, God stood in the congregation of God, and admits he shall destroy out of my God's wisdom. Exactly. So it's this concept that God in his revelation was shown first to be the strongest of all the other gods. Yeah. And over time, we understand that this starts to flip away, that in the congregation of gods, it's the idea of angels, angelic okay. mites, yeah. demons. So that God is seen constantly like that, and these demons are masquerading as gods, such mm -hmm. as Baal. And yet, what we're going to see over this course of Revelation is that there is no other God. There is only God. And everything else is a lie. Everything else is a falsehood. Or a powerful creature, which isn't truly a God in the definition of a God. Correct. Definition of a God. Correct, which is why we look at this, that, that okay. definition number two of this. this false God is not a God. It's a demon masquerading as a God. Ancient people understood God very differently than God actually. Correct, and this is yeah. one of the reasons why, and we'll, not, not in Exodus, but like, for example, in, um, in Kings, when Elijah uh, has basically the miracle off with uh, Bathsheba, and, excuse me, not Bathsheba, Jezebel, and um, they slaughter the other priests, it's not because the idea of, oh, we've got to kill everybody, it's the idea that my God is stronger than your God. Mm -hmm. And so we continue to see this, this understanding of somehow the Israelites is their God versus other gods without understanding that it's not God versus other gods, it is God versus demon kind and mm -hmm. man-made problems. It's probably in that time that's how you showed your your pantheon defeating another pantheon. Correct. And this, their priests exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And this is one of the reasons why, because people yeah. look at you know, and they have to understand the God of the Old Testament is still the God of the New Testament. And yeah. it's it's hard to reconcile this idea. It's like this God of the New Old Testament that's basically saying slaughter them all. Well, the reason why I'm saying slaughter them all is because again, exactly as you said, it's the idea of showing dominance of your godliness versus their godliness. It was what they understood. It was yeah. within the context of the revelation. But again, this is okay because what happened in the resurrection? What happened when Jesus Christ descended into hell? Who was in hell? Almost everybody. Only two people weren't present, Elijah and Enoch. Everybody, good and bad alike, were in hell. Yeah. Which meant that everyone at that moment had a chance. Um to repent, okay. to follow after Christ. So basically it was the, the universe's one and only do-over. Mm -hmm. They had a chance. So all those people that died believing that something greater was to come were able to come. And this is why we look at the icon of the resurrection, Jesus Christ lifting up Adam and Eve. We see uh, John the Baptist talking to King Solomon, and King David, pointing to Christ, showing this is where he is. And it should seem obvious. We see the nimbus around God, that he is descended into hell. It is, it is unambiguous of who and what he is, and yet we still see people off to the side turning away. Why? Why are they turning away, despite the fact that unambiguously Jesus Christ is descending into hell to rescue everyone? They don't want the truth. They don't want the truth. Their hearts are so, just like Pharaoh, as we're going to continue here, their hearts are so clouded so darkened that even with God right in front of their face, lifting his hand saying, come with me and I will save you. And they still reject it. A question for you. A little off topic. Um, Elijah Nina never died. Correct. And it, it says in Hebrews says, everyone shall die once and then the judgment. Uh, are they going to be the two prophets at the end time? While we don't know definitively, that, no, is, that, is, that, that, is, the, that is the understanding, is that Elijah and Mark will, in fact, die. This is one of the reasons why, for example, the Virgin Mary, even though she never made a conscious sin, she never made a, 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 a mistake, as we say. Uh, this is why we call her Panagia. This is why we call her above the Platitera, the, 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 the Tenth Order of Angels, the Queen of the born. Angels. It wasn't just that she was born in sin, because when, when, Christ, when Christ came and he died, that's wiped out. So what is killing us at that point is not just special sin, sin and our mistakes. So she was able to die. She did die, which means that there was some sin in her. That in some ways she made a mistake, not a conscious mistake, not a voluntarily mistake, but sin nonetheless. And Christ himself came and escorted her up. Everyone, without exception, will taste death, just as Christ tasted death 
in the resurrection in order for all of us to be the same. So Enoch and Elijah will die. How they'll die, when they'll die, that's not something that I can understand or know. But that they will die, yes. That they will be, that they will be martyrs for, for God. And martyrdom, keep in mind, martyrdom doesn't just mean you know, shedding blood. It means being a true witness. And of course, Elijah and Enoch, the whole reason why they were bodily assumed into paradise was because of their true witness. So shall we continue? But Pharaoh will not heed you, and I shall lay my hand on Egypt and bring my people and the children of Israel of the land of Egypt with my power and great vengeance. Then all the Egyptians shall know I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So he said this again and again and again and again. But he said that Pharaoh will not believe you. Now is this fate? Is it fated that Pharaoh will not believe? Because some people read this and they look at the idea that God, the, the phrase, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You earlier, this initial uh, scripture said that he, he hardened his own heart and then God hardened his heart after that. So he was given the opportunity to let the Israelites go free, but he hardened his heart and then God kept bringing opportunity for him and kept hardening his heart. Correct. I don't think it was so much God hardening his heart. No, and that's the important distinction, is that Pharaoh himself hardened the heart. It's not that God forced Pharaoh's heart closed. It's not like to say it was Pharaoh's fate. It was his destiny to, uh, to do what he did to the Israelites. No, Pharaoh had every opportunity to do what God wanted him to do. And yet he continuously hardened his heart. So when it says God hardened his heart, it wasn't that God hardened it is that God gave him opportunities and he never took them. Now, this is important for us because we have to understand that our fate as Christians is not predetermined. Mm -hmm. We do not believe in destiny. We do not believe in this idea that everything is foregone for 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 and foreclosed. But there's a difference here between destined and foreknowledge. So when God is saying, Pharaoh will not heed you, it's not that he's saying, well, I'm not going to let him heed you. It's that God exists outside of time. God knows what is going to happen. So there's a difference between God forcing something to happen versus God knowing what is going to happen. And this is very, very important to understand the difference between foreknowledge and destiny. Which goes against the Calvinistic viewpoint. Which, Correct. Which is double predestination. Double predestination. The idea that if two individuals have the exact same life, marry the exact same kind of person, raise the exact same kind of children, take the exact same number of sacraments, come to the chalice the exact same number of times, one of them is damned and one of them is saved because it's of destiny, because they were chosen that way. Um, this kind of uh, terminology basically eradicates culpability from us because it basically says that well, I'm damned because God foretold that I would be damned. Uh, it was ordained that I'm going to be damned. So therefore, I don't really have any responsibility to it. Uh, this kind of... Uh, viewpoint of God is, is very problematic. Um, and this is one of the reasons why that Calvinistic uh, thought process died out. Um, that it is not something that we prescribed. And I don't think even the, uh, the Baptists of today uh, would totally subscribe to that notion of predestination. Um, and even Augustine, who basically was the, the root of it, uh, later in his works basically said, yeah, I, I shouldn't have wrote that. That was wrong. In Maximus, the confessor of Pharaoh Cochrane, when he talks about hardening Pharaoh's heart, he describes it like clay versus wax in the sun. So the presence of God hardens heart because he rejects God or God's presence, not because God goes up. Correct. His, his view is he sees God, his natural response is to reject. Exactly. And this is that same, this is why I brought the analogy between yeah. the people in hell, because that fire is in, is in your face. When, Je when Jesus Christ came down, remember what happened on Mount Tabor? When God, for just a moment, revealed himself to his disciples in his full glory at the transfiguration, what happened to Peter, James, and John? They fell on their faces. I mean, if you look at the icons, they're, they're gagging. It, it's so, they can't even deal with the, with the power that is in front of them, with the magic that's in front of them, God himself in front of them. That's what came down in hell. That's what's in front of people. It is not ambiguous. It's not, okay, well, there's a guy over there in a beard and, and white clothes, and maybe, maybe that's the Savior. No, it's, uh, it's unambiguous. It is the Lord 
in his full glory as the son of time. The second person of the Trinity is present. This is why the gates of hell are shattered. That's why you see all those manacles, all those chains just absolutely obliterated. This is the unambiguous Christ in your presence. And just like Pharaoh, the first reaction, instead of getting on your, on your knees and, and being you know, in awe of what's in front of you, turn away. Reject it. And that's horrific. But that is what happened. That is what happened to Pharaoh. That is what happens to all people that ultimately reject God when God continuously steps forward to try and save. And we're going to see here that even though Pharaoh, it seems like he's predestined, he's going to get a lot of opportunities to change his mind. He's going to get a lot of opportunities where God is going to say, look, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. I don't want to do the ninth and final plague. I don't want to do that. The, the, the plague of the firstborn. Do you think that, that God is revealing to Moses over and over again he's going to deliver the people because he knows there's going to be a lot of tests that are going to be coming out and he just needs to get it cemented in his mind that it's going to be delivered? You, it, there is that. And, of course, as we will see when the, uh, the, the interlude of the, uh, the rock where it will not gush forth water, uh, that Moses still is... Uh, is upset and is very, very um, angry. You know, after all, he took the first 10 commandments, <laughs> it shatters them, uh, because he just couldn't take it, couldn't deal with it. Um, so God is patiently, if we're, if we're being honest, revealing himself, showing himself, I've got you, it's in my control. And even the people that are your enemies, I'm gonna keep trying. Thus, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you saying, show us a sign or a wonder, then you say to Aaron, your brother, take your rod and cast it on the ground before Pharaoh and it shall become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh and his servants and they did so as the Lord commanded them. Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and his serpents and it became a serpent. In response, Pharaoh called together the wise men, the sorcerers, and the chambers of Egypt. And in like manner, they did the same with their sorceries. For each man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not give heed to them as the Lord commanded. God still gave authority to his magicians that they could do the same thing with their rods. Or so basically what is going on is what, what is powering those magicians? Is it God? No. It's demons. They're demons that they are worshiping. So okay. demons give... People power, give them the ability to do these things. Okay. So basically, every single miracle that we're going to see, yes, the evil one can reproduce. Why is that significant? Why is it important for us to understand that all of these signs can be reproduced? What is going to happen later when Jesus Christ is asked that exact same question? Show me a sign. Like you say, he won't show people who ask for it. Exactly. Yeah. Because sign means nothing. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And it also kind of tells us something else too, that we can't necessarily trust what we see, because what is the devil? What was his name before he became Satan? Lucifer. Was he, you know, a big pitchfork wielding half goat, red faced uh, character? No. How does the devil interact with us most times? In a beautiful guise. So signs and even miracles can be false. They can be misleading. This is problematic. So how did, I guess from a very broad perspective, how do people know to follow Christ then? Some of the Pharisees accused him of having a demon even. Exactly, yeah. because Christ was able to do some things they could not do. Okay. So the one thing that Christ did that they could not do, the ultimate miracle, which was what basically prevented everything. The resurrection. The resurrection. Okay. And not just his resurrection. When he resurrected Lazarus, okay. it was the number one thing. No one could reproduce that. Okay. They tried. Like, for example, uh, with St. John the Theologian, when he was on the island of Patmos, uh, the sorcerer Kenos, very similar to this, mm -hmm. was able to use demonic magic to, quote-unquote, resurrect three dead young boys mm -hmm. that had drowned. But they weren't the boys. It was demons in the similitude of the boys. No one outside of Christ 
was able to resurrect okay. the dead. Or the little well, girl. Elijah was able to do that, though. Correct. And how did he do it? He laid on top of the In what form? A cross. Hmm. He, well, he prayed to God. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which showed that Elijah was cognizant. It wasn't through me. Yeah. God was the one that resurrected. And Elijah is a prototype of Christ. This is one of the reasons why Elijah uh, gets brought up into heaven. And one of the reasons why uh, when Christ was on the cross, they said he's calling out to Elijah because it was understood in that context. But no one else, no one else had ever been able to resurrect the dead. And certainly not in the form that Jesus did. Because even the widow's son, that was an immediate thing. He died and then Elijah saved her. It was very much just like Jarius' daughter where she died and immediately she was brought back. I guess the difference would be Elijah didn't say, I have this power. Correct. Me. Correct. Yeah. And Peter raised this after the resurrection yeah. because it showed that the power of Christ, because he said, what I have, you will have, which means including the power to raise the dead, which was something that no one else could do. But what made Christ God, as opposed to what all these other people was doing, is that, yes, Christ could raise the dead, and he gave that power to everyone else. But what did he do that no one else could do? He raised himself from the dead. The death had no power over him. But the reason why Lazarus was so important was because Jesus Christ raised three people from the dead. I know he raised more, but three people are listed in Scripture. The first is Jairus' daughter. The second is the widow's son, Naim. And the third is Lazarus. And in each one of those, we see how God interacted with death. With Darius' daughter, it was an immediate. She had just died within the hour, brought her back to life. People could say, you know what? Maybe she wasn't really dead. Maybe it was fake. Mm -hmm. After all, he kicked out everyone except the parents and his trusted disciples. The second one was the widow's son, Naim. It was during the funeral procession. And it was very, very, it freaked people out because Jesus Christ touched the funeral pyre, which you can't do that. That's defiling. But of course, he's life. Life can touch death and not be defiled. But even then, too, they could have looked at it as, okay, maybe he wasn't dead. Because Jewish rites, same then as now, when did you bury somebody? Mm -hmm. Within 24 hours, you needed to do the burial. So again, they could have looked at it and said, well, that widow's son, maybe he wasn't really dead. Maybe he was just really, really sick, fell into a coma, and then he came back. But with Lazarus, Jesus Christ knew he was sick and still two extra days. So by the time he got to Lazarus, it was four days. Why was that significant? Because the Jews believed that the person's spirit or whatever was hovering around for up to three days. Right. Which meant that basically if you're still dead after four days, you're good and dead. Yeah. And in fact, in beyond that, if, as you look at the icons, the, the people when they're, when they're pulling the uh, – the tomb open, they're covering their mouths because it stinks. Why did it stink? Because he was decomposing. Yeah. <laughs> Lazarus was decomposing. His corpse was rotting. Now, this, was, this is important to understand because um, this is important to understand. Lazarus's tomb was just for him. He was rich enough that he was able to have his own personal tomb. If you've ever been to Israel, you'll get to go in there. You basically descend 30 feet down into this little chamber where his body would have laid. So when Jesus Christ called him out, he had to walk up basically 30 feet of stairs to come out that he did. So that stench was just other bodies where you could say, oh, well, maybe it was other corpses. That was Lazarus' stench. That was his death. So when Jesus Christ raised Lazarus, this is why the very you know, next couple of days when he walks into Jerusalem, uh, he's being seen as, okay, this is the Messiah. So, this is what we're encountering. So, they've been able to reproduce this miracle. That very first miracle that when Moses said, okay, great. They'll, they'll believe that I'm from God if I do this. Well, now Pharaoh has reproduced that. But what do we see happens? The serpent that Aaron had swallowed all the other serpents, which shows that all of this mysticism, all of these falsehoods, all of them will be swallowed by Christ. 
So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. But to Pharaoh early in the morning when he goes to water and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him, and you shall take in your hand the rod that turned into a serpent. Then you shall say to him, the Lord God of Hebrews has sent me to you saying, let my people go to serve me in the desert. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water in the river and the rod in my hand, and it shall be turned into blood. Then the fish in the river shall die. The river shall stink, and the Egyptians will be unable to drink from the river. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, your brother, take your rod in your hand and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, their canals, their ponds, and all their standing waters, so they may become blood. There shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessel and wood, of wood and of stone. So Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded them. Aaron lifted his hand with the rod and struck the water in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. And all the waters in the river were turned to blood. The fish in the river died and the river stank and the Egyptians could not drink from the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Then the sorcerer of Egypt did the same with their sorceries. Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not heed them as the Lord said. Pharaoh then turned and went to his house. Neither was his heart moved by this. So all the Egyptians dug around the river for water to drink because he could not drink from the water of the river. Then seven days passed after the Lord struck the river. The Egyptians are getting the bad end of the stick for Pharaoh's behavior. Pretty much. <laughs> now the Lord spoke to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go to serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up to come into your houses, into your bedroom, on your bed, in the house of your servants, on the people, in your ovens, into the baked kneading bowls, and frogs shall come up, and you and your people and your servants. We're going to stop here at the end of chapter 7 to allow time for questions. But basically what we're seeing is that all of these miracles that God is doing, on first glance, you go, oh my gosh, how can you ignore that? But the demons are allowing these miracles to be reproduced. And God is speaking to Pharaoh. He's saying, you didn't believe me, but I am the Lord. So he is giving him chance after chance after chance. Now, be very, pay very close attention to the wording here, that his heart hardened after he saw his sorcerers do the same thing, which tells us that it was not that he wasn't impressed. It was that doubt entered into his mind that he did not have that faith to say that, oh, this is this Lord, this Lord, this God of Moses and Aaron, this, this Lord God means business. Well, no, my people can do the same thing, so it's really not that big a deal, despite the fact that what we're witnessing is cosmic in nature. I mean, if anyone saw anything like that, we're not just uh, the water in the river, but everything, whether it's in wooden cross, whether it's in stone jars, everything turned to blood. That's terrifying. Presumably his thought was that he wasn't impressed with their God because his gods were equal. Equal. But I mean, the later miracles, they couldn't reproduce them. So. Correct. And this, this is why eventually Pharaoh will say, let them go. But again, his doubt returns, and he again decides that he's going after them. Even after he lost his son. Even after he lost his firstborn son. Now... This notion of faith, this notion of false miracles, is very, very important to us, uh, especially in this time when we see magicians, we see uh, a resurgence of Wicca and pagan religions, uh, that people can look at that and go, oh my gosh, look at this amazing thing that they're doing. Shouldn't impress us. In the same way the Pharaoh was, it shouldn't impress us because we know what can cause those things to happen. We can understand why and how uh, the evil one is able to reproduce these quote-unquote miracles. And this is why the fathers of the church say the greater miracle is not the miracle of something external. It is internal. That our heart softening is the greatest miracle. If Pharaoh's heart had softened, that would have been the greatest miracle of all of them. If he had softened his heart to embrace the Lord of the Israelites. But that didn't happen. And this is to show us again and again and again that external miracles, people look for signs. People look for these external miracles. If I can just see a miracle, I'll believe. But that's not how faith works. Those external miracles, everyone sees them. And then people try to explain them away. 
Like they'll talk about uh, the hand of St. John the Baptist that is still warm. Say, oh, well, that has to do with the soil that's around it. Really? They'll talk about all the different miracles that we see and wonder, okay, how can that be? Well, let's, let's try to explain it away. For example, how in the world does St. John Chrysostom still have his ear on his, on his skull? The whole thing is a skeleton, except his ear. St. Paul talked into his ear. Right, yeah. So basically, say, this is what I meant when I wrote what I wrote. Hmm. Miracle after miracle after miracle is open to us, and we can see those miracles. But if our heart doesn't believe, it doesn't matter. Signs in and of themselves don't matter. After all, if we look to Jesus Christ, when the Jews said to him, you know, show us proof that you are who you are. The Jewish law basically said that if you can bring two witnesses to corroborate your story, that's good. Jesus gave four. He said, my father bears witness unto me. John the Baptist, who you all acclaim is a prophet, says, who I, am, says I am what I am. The miracles that I do that no one else could do attest to who I am. And the prophets attest to who I am. So he provided twice the recommended use of the law in order to prove who he was. Did they believe him? No. And even after the resurrection, those that had followed him still didn't understand or believe necessarily that he'd risen from the dead. Their hearts were hardened. Yeah. It said the Jews look for a sign and the Greeks look for wisdom. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem, is that we're so busy in our externals for forgetting to understand nature. This is why it was that God can create children of Abraham from the stones. But what are the children of Abraham? The children of Abraham are not the children of the bloodline. They are the children of faith that believe in the Lord God. So this is very, very important to us to understand that these miracles, these signs are not what we should be looking for. We should be looking for a communion and a relationship with our God. So I believe all the judgments that took place during those 10 judgments mm -hmm. were actually to come against the beliefs of these false gods because the frogs and the waters, they, they all believe in, in these new gods. Mm -hmm. So each one of them was to show the third gods or powerless against this guy. To an extent, especially to show that this, this escalation, once we finally get to the final um, miracle of the, uh, the, the, the killing of the firstborn, the, the Pascha, the Passover, uh, all of this was to show that this is where it comes. You all can do imitation up to a point, but there's a point that you can't. And that was where Pharaoh's breaking point was. So it is to show the powerlessness of those gods. It is a, uh, to show the powerlessness of the idols. And we're going to see that throughout history, throughout the saints. Basically, the lives of all of these saints, well, again and again and again and again, these false gods try to do something, and every single time it is obliterated. Because we have the power of Jesus Christ behind us and in us. Any questions from the uh, online uh, participants? No, but thank you. It was very interesting and very educational. And glory be to God. Uh, I wanted to know, you know, when he turns everything into things that are I'm having trouble hearing you, Mrs. Tobias. Can you hear me now? No? Can you hear me? Barely. Go ahead. Okay, let me get a little closer. Uh, when he turned the uh, water, excuse me, into blood, how did the Israelites survive? Same way the Egyptians did, by trying to dig trenches to find things. You know, it's kind of like Benjamin was saying, is like Pharaoh's decisions are hurting all of the Egyptians, which include yeah. Israelites. Yeah. So, yeah, it affected everybody. This was to show the might of God, that it affected all the people. Only with the Passover do we see where the Israelites get spared what's happening. All right. Three people are online. How many people are online today? Uh, three people. Well, actually, four if you count. Uh, one of them is two people. Okay. Well, it shows how invincible human pride can be. Mm -hmm. If you don't want something, 
There's a lot of things you're willing to you want to believe something. There's a lot of things you're willing to do. This is true. Yeah, I've had friends that were atheists or agnostics, and they always try to debate me and all that. And like, what it comes down to is faith in Christ. I mean, they could come up with all reasons why they don't believe. And my friend, just about a month or two before he died, uh, was trying to, to debate me. I was like, when he died, I was like, Lord, my best friend, he's my closest friend. He just died suddenly, <laughs> 60 years old. And, like Lord, I hope that before He passed away, that He would have repented. And well, and that's why that's why we pray. That's why we pray for the dead because we don't know what that person's last repentance was in their heart. Um, I wrote read a uh, thing online that I thought was kind of cute. Atheists, I've never met anyone that argues so vehemently against something they believe doesn't exist. <laughs> like, why do you care <laughs> if I believe? And you don't, what does that matter? Why, do, why does it need to enter into our discourse? Anyway, Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, present in all place and filling all things, come and dwell in us, come of every stain, and save our souls, gracious Lord. Thank you all, and have a wonderful week.